welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. If you're old enough to have lived through the Cold War, well, you're going to truly appreciate this episode. And if you're just kind of curious about the secrets the military can hide right under your nose here in Connecticut, well, you'll also find it intriguing. My guest, John Ramsey, is the man behind a website called coldwar-ct.com, and he's documented secrets from the Cold War era of facilities, weapon sites built throughout Connecticut in the 1950s, all to protect us from a nuclear World War III. All the information is now declassified, so you don't have to worry about that, and it's suitable for public digestion, but you may have a little bit of indigestion after you hear about some of this. And now, Connecticut's Cold War Secrets. The overall impact of this particular podcast episode on you may be directly proportional to your age. Now, I hate to pull the age card, but I was alive during the Cold War era between Russia and the United States, and it was a bit of a frightening time, to be honest. We always wondered whether a nuclear bomb was going to wipe us out at any given moment of the day. There's even an iconic movie that was made of the dangers of the Cold War called Dr. Strangelove. You may have seen it, and if you haven't, I'm not going to spoil it. I'm just going to say it was supposed to be comedic at times, but it packs a very powerful message about nuclear war. You should see it. John Ramsey is an electrical engineer. In fact, he serves as chief engineer for a very large number of Connecticut radio stations. And one day, he just got curious about what we know and what we don't know about Connecticut's nuclear secrets during the nuclear war days of the Cold War, when military operations were quite different than they were today, because, frankly, they could hide things right under our nose without us knowing about it, which it would be harder to get away with today. Well, John and I are in the same age bracket, and it turns out we share a common memory of those darker days when we had to duck under our desks in school to try and protect us from a nuclear blast, which, of course, was useless. Well, anyway, when I reviewed his website, it was chock full of seemingly secretive or at least sensitive information, and it led me to wonder a lot of things. The first thing that came to mind was, how did you get into this and how did you get all this information? I, I've just got to hear the story. What got you on this track and then how did you pursue it? I grew up during the Cold War. I was eight years old when the Cuban Missile Crisis took place and I didn't really know that what that was. But I remember seeing uh, the president, you know, Kennedy, on TV and my parents talking about war. So that's pretty scary when you're a kid. And that was followed up not long after by the duck and cover drills in public school. And uh, that uh, was pretty sobering, hearing that if you lived more than 15 minutes walking distance, you had to stay at school. But if you were less than 15 minutes, they'd let you go and uh, you could get home and <laughs> watch the bombs fall. So as I grew up, you know, somewhat scared of the bomb, as, as we all should be and, and have been, I decided, because I've got a technical background, I'm an electrical engineer by trade, to learn more about the technology. And uh, that's what my way of coping with it, I think. And then uh, much later on, I realized that the information I had gathered would probably make a good website and ultimately a book that I'm working on. That's why coldwar-ct.com is there. Well, I'm in the exact same age group as you. I was petrified of the thought of walking home and seeing the sky turn pink or orange or whatever color it would turn when the hydrogen bomb hit New York City because uh, I grew up in uh, southern Fairfield County and we all do thought New York City was a target. One of the great things that your website does amongst so many, I can't, there's so many accolades to throw your way, but the one I'm going to focus on for just a second is all of the Nike missile sites that were in Connecticut that nobody even knew about. And if you were even in that town, you didn't know about it because that's how the military did things. They were secretive. It's almost like when you talk about NORAD Mountain in Colorado and how they went in behind Pikes Peak and that whole range there and dug into the mountain just down the, the range from Pikes Peak and, and built NORAD Mountain inside, and nobody in Colorado Springs even knew about it. It's just amazing how they pulled this off. But there were in total, because uh, they decided to make Hartford and Bridgeport protected areas and then ring those cities, and you went about and found all of the sites. Hartford, Bridgeport, and New Haven all had anti-aircraft batteries, but those were replaced in the mid-50s by... Uh, Nike missile batteries, which were ground-to-air missiles, one missile, one bomber, that they would target a bomber using the radar site, blow it up where the fragmentation 
like a big hand grenade, but much more powerful. And so even if it wasn't a direct hit, they'd be able to take the bombers down. That was fine for a few years. And then the CIA identified what they called the bomber gap. We thought the Russians had a lot more bombers than they did and that they might send instead of one or two bombers to Hartford or to Bridgeport, they might send dozens. So the second generation Mikey, which was called the Hercules, was deployed and those used fewer sites, but they ended up with fission or atomic warheads, uh, similar to the one that we dropped on Hiroshima. So that was even uh, more of a secret than the sites themselves was the fact that there were nuclear weapons in people's backyards. And most of these towns, these people grew up oblivious to this. They had no idea it was in their backyard. And, and as you say, when they switched over to the Hercules uh, nuclear missile program, you had the towns of Ansonia, Cromwell, and East Windsor that had nuclear weapons in silos that were pointed, you know, upward. And these these people from 19, roughly, roughly 1960 to 1971, 73, had no idea these things were there. One of the notable quotes that I believe you can find on YouTube, it wasn't General LeMay, but it was one of the prominent generals in the Army that was uh, in charge of the program. He was asked at a press conference early on, do we really want to launch nuclear weapons and have them detonate in the sky over our cities? And paraphrasing him, he said, much better, much better a nuke above New York City than on New York City. Yeah, that's a quote for the ages, to, to be sure. Yeah. You have so much more on the website. And not only do you have this information on there, but I think it's important to point out that you have personally visited a lot of these places and a lot of the photos that you have online, which we're going to give the website at the end again of this uh, program so that people can go and look at these photographs. These are absolutely amazing that these things either did exist and in some cases, the you know, the uh, sort of rotted out buildings still exist in Connecticut and, and can be seen. It's just amazing. So let's start with this thing called Horse Ridge Cellars. Now, I love this. It's, first of all, it's not so easy to find on Google. I had to actually Google address Horse Ridge Cellars because when you just type in Horse Ridge Cellars, it's a beautiful little website about wine storage, but I couldn't figure out where it was, and it's in Stafford on the uh, Connecticut Massachusetts border. Just tell us this story. What was the story behind Horse Ridge Cellars? Back right after the Cuban Missile Crisis, business and industry realized that they needed to do whatever they could to protect themselves from World War III, from a Russian nuclear attack. And Hartford being the insurance capital at the time, their stock and trade for the insurance companies, of course, were records. You know, uh, They had both paper records of accounts and insurance policies and billing information. And they also had microfiche and microfilm. They realized Hartford was a definite target because of Pratt & Whitney and the other defense industries that were there. So they got together with a bunch of banks who also wanted to protect their records and built a Atomic Energy Commission-approved underground bunker in Stafford uh, to protect all of their records. So it was a consortium of about 20 companies that built this thing to, to AEC specs so that it would survive an attack, not a direct attack on it, but an attack on Springfield or on Hartford. It existed for 15 or 20 years as an underground storage repository. It was empty and not in for sale. And a, a gentleman and his wife, young guy, bought the thing and converted it into a wine storage facility. Underground being dark and vibration-free and constant temperature is ideal for storing wine. It absolutely is. Let's go to Cheshire. AT&T, which has been a absolute bellwether company in terms of U.S. military operations for decades. On Higgins Road in Cheshire, people drive by this site all the time. They see a couple of antennae sticking up, but they don't realize what's underground there. What did the military build in 1966 there, and why did they build it? Well, part of the preparing for World War III and the Strategic Air Command having uh, bombers and missiles ready to launch on a moment's notice, that only works if you've got connectivity. So in the early 50s, AT&T got a contract to wire the whole country with nuclear-hardened communications for all the Air Force bases and military bases around the country. Nuclear-hardened means it has to be able to withstand not only the blast effects, but also the heat and the radiation burst from a nuclear detonation. So AT&T built these, they were called L3 and L4 sites, that connected all the Air Force bases to the Pentagon and to NORAD, which you already mentioned. And they were all outside target areas, like the one in Connecticut was in Cheshire, which is far enough away from Hartford and New Haven, which were two obviously targets. And they used both microwaves, 
to connect the sites, but also they buried cable. They buried copper cables all the way from Miami up to Maine and then all the way up to California and up and down the West Coast. And the, the nodes uh, to where these things were, where these signals were relayed, were nuclear hardened underground bunkers, similar to a miniature version of NORAD, although not inside a mountain, but they were buried 50 feet underground, buildings on springs buried underground that could withstand. They talked about a one megaton detonation within a mile. And uh, that's just an incredible amount of destructive force. These things were operated for 20 years, and then the Cold War ended, and we went on to a different defense posture. And AT&T still runs a lot of the sites as just central offices and cell sites. So the one in Cheshire is still active, has no military connection. The nearest one uh, to the north is in Chesterfield, Mass., and I visited that one, too, and there's pictures on the website of both those sites. Fascinating construction and a real interesting history of what they went through. The people who worked there knew that at any time, heaven forbid, if the war started, that they'd survive, but their families wouldn't. I can't imagine what that was like. Yeah. No, I can't either. Try to, if you can, paint a picture of what's in Cheshire underground. Now, you said a building on springs, it's underground. Try and convey to people what's underground and and what's inside that structure based on your tour of it. Yeah, 100,000 square feet is what, 20 times or or more the the average uh, American home. I toured it back in the 80s when it was still somewhat active and all the equipment racks were hanging on springs from the ceiling so that they could survive the whole building where they said would bounce up and down two or three feet. And they wanted to make sure that the equipment didn't get jostled too much. Even today, when you go down the stairs to it, the first thing you see halfway down is a light bulb hanging on a spring from the ceiling. And if you go into the restroom, all the toilets are on springs, (laughs) not to protect the occupants, tongue in cheek, but to keep the plumbing from breaking when the building bounces up and down. You know, a facility with, uh, that's meant to support 200 people for a month with no running water, that's a problem. So all the plumbing had flexible fixtures so the building could bounce. But the walls are four feet thick, incredible amount of ventilation to protect from fallout and, and also biological and chemical warfare. At a speech that you gave at the Connecticut State Library, you said something which I think is really important, which was that we all kind of lived under this misnomer uh, when we saw these underground fallout shelter signs and we thought okay if we hear the air raid sirens go off and the planes are overhead we'll just run down into one of these fallout shelters but you say that was just really uh, window dressing that that wouldn't really have protected people yeah i was shocked to find that because i was under the same impression that if you know if you happen to be near one of those fallout shelter signs you might have a chance if the bomb wasn't directly overhead but the one thing in touring many of them and in reading a lot of the literature They'd be fine for a storm shelter for a tornado or a hurricane because they were all in steel frame buildings in the basement. And they'd be fine for a World War II type attack when the people in London, for instance, had uh, hit in the subways. But every single one that I toured and all the documentation that I've seen, Mike, there's no mention of air filtration. So you put 200 people in the basement of your bank, it's going to get awful hot really quick. And you're going to need to bring in lots of air to, for, so people can breathe and so that there can be cooling. But if you bring in the air, you'll bring in fallout after a nuclear attack. So uh, it would, they seem to me to be just placebo effects. They were just there to kind of appease the public and not to really serve a useful function. So sad to learn all this years later. Yeah. Saving, I, I hate to put it the best for last, and I'm not even sure this is the best thing on, on the website in terms of the most eye-opening, but to me, in many ways it is, which is the Knoll Atomic Lab in Windsor, Connecticut, which is not even 10 miles outside of Hartford, Connecticut. And to set this one up, growing up in Connecticut, you knew that there were nuclear power plants at the Millstone site along the Long Island shore. You knew there was Connecticut Yankee in uh, East Haddam. Uh, And so you kind of knew where these places were. Nobody knew that less than 10 miles from Hartford, there was a nuclear plant in Windsor, where they were doing what? Well, I had a professor in high school back in the early 70s. He was with the military, I think National Guard part-time. He said, you know, there's three nuclear reactors within 10 miles of downtown Hartford. And I took it with a grain of salt. But then in doing the research for the website, I realized that there'd been a small nuclear reactor at the Hartford State Technical College, believe it or not, and that there was one or two at Knoll Labs and maybe combustion engineering in Windsor. The Knoll Labs was operating up until the 90s. They had a uh, nuclear submarine reactor there, not a prototype, an actual reactor. Navy seamen were trained on how to operate uh, reactors there. 
Lab. So thousands of uh, students went through over the 30 or 40 years that it was open. It was owned by Knoll Labs, which is a big facility up in the Albany area. But this was one of their satellite facilities where they trained reactor operators and kept it really on the QT. The, I mean, I talked to the town about it. They were aware that it was there. It was run by GE for the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy. It's completely remediated. It's greenfields now, and they're building condos on the site. So they did a nice job cleaning it up. I know you're an electrical engineer, not a nuclear engineer, but there were residential houses not far from this site. Had there been an accident, what would have been the general fallout effect of something like this? The town engineer of Windsor, when he found out about it, he was a professional acquaintance of mine back in the 80s. He said he went in there to ask to to find out, because this was right after the federal government required that all business provide the good local town governments with a list of any hazardous materials. And he was shocked to find what they had there. He walked in in his company car to get some information because they hadn't filed the proper paperwork. And he got it escorted out by the guards. And then uh, the next day, the mayor or the town selectman, whatever they have in Windsor, was visited by people from Washington, from the Department of Energy. They just said, listen, if there's a problem at the Knoll Labs, there's nothing your local fire department or people will be able to do. We'll handle it. Well, that's uh, reassuring and uh, puts uh, all your uh, concerns to rest. And I found a newspaper clipping from, I think, the 70s, maybe early 80s, where they mistakenly took low-level nuclear waste to the nearby landfill instead of to the place in South Carolina where it's supposed to go. So there were mistakes. There were problems. But it's all been certified by the state and by the town as being cleaned up. And I'm, I'm pretty confident they did a good job with that. In 1993, when they decommissioned it, you found another article that you have on site with the uh, from the Hartford Current. Uh, which basically said how the spent nuclear fuel rods from that facility were taken out to Idaho. Tell me what you uh, what's in that article and what you found. Yeah, I was quite curious about it. Spent nuclear fuel rods are the most dangerous and the most radioactive material that's ever handled anywhere because of the type of reactor that was. The spent fuel it was weapons grade, so a terrorist could steal that and make a, an atomic bomb out of it. That's a, a big deal. So they used the old Griffin line, which was a somewhat abandoned railroad right of way. Hadn't been used probably in 20 years. It went from Windsor to downtown Hartford. They fixed it up, and it runs right by the University of Hartford, where I work. So that's what piqued my interest. I saw them improving it and fixing it up and replacing the ties. So I did some research, and I was actually able to see what they call the death train, U.S. Army engine with six empty cars behind it, and then the huge heavy hauler that carries the fuel cask, followed by six empty cars, and then a caboose that says DODX on it that has all sorts of gun sights on it. (laughs) It's a security caboose, so I actually saw that. I didn't have a camera with me, and they probably wouldn't have liked me taking pictures of it, but they took the two fuel loads out in the early morning into downtown Hartford, to Springfield, then to Albany, and out to Idaho. And it went through, or at least by, several major cities on the way. It went within 100 feet of the dormitories at the University of Hartford and right by two elementary schools. I mean, they do it early in the morning, but still, uh, yeah. They say it's safer to do it on the rail than it is on the highway because it's harder for people to access, I guess, you know, bad players, you know. And if something happens, if the train breaks down, it's easy to cordon off a railroad track than it is an interstate highway. (laughs) Maybe parentheses without publicity. (laughs) Sleep tight tonight. up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path. If this topic is of high interest to you, you may want to check out my earlier two-part series on nuclear missile sites in Connecticut. Those would be episodes 10 and 11 from back in October of 2021. I want to thank my guest for this episode, John Ramsey, and I encourage you to have a look at his exhaustive website of secrets in Connecticut from the Cold War era, including a ton of incredible photographs. The website named, appropriately enough, coldwar-ct.com. If you like the show, tell your family, friends, and colleagues to click in as well. And in between episodes, please check out my Facebook page at Amazing Tales CT. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy. (laughs) 